God damn it, Cora. I have enough damn cliffhangers from Breaking Bad. I don't need any more. Ugh. I don't need... I don't need another show where I have to go, Man, I wonder how they're going to resolve that in the next episode and be worried about it for like a whole week. I get enough of that from Breaking Bad. Just... Ah. Yes. This... Okay. This episode. Episode 3 of Book 2, Spirits. Episode 3 called Civil War Part 1. Yes, this is a cliffhanger. And yes, I called it. This, all this conflict between Terak and Unalak is leading up to Civil War, and, um, yeah, this is not going to be good. It, it, and really, this, this shows, and then this episode, it shows the seeds that are being planted for a potential future conflict that will not end well for either side, so... And really, that you know, Unalak's, Unalak and Terek are right. The only people who can help are the Avatar. Or Varak. Sorry. Varak. Not Terek. I don't know where I got Terek from. Uh, Varak and Unalak. My bad. So, let's get started. Talk, I've talked about this. I know it's late getting this up because it aired last night I normally like to do impressions like the night of just so I can avoid spoilers but you know whatever oh and keep in mind this this will be spoiler filled I mean I'm not gonna not talk about anything all right so the one thing that I noticed first of all in this episode it presents a new challenge for Korra while Aang in the last airbender had a very specific goal that he needed to stop the Fire Nation from dominating all other benders. Here, it's different because it's much smaller, and yet it's a much more smaller conflict, and yet it's more intimate for Korra because this is Korra's home, where she has to maintain neutrality between the North and the South. Yet, internally, she's also torn by her loyalty to the South and her, her family. I mean, this is a really interesting new challenge for Korra, and so far, uh, well, I'll, I'll get to that later, uh, really, well, no, I won't. Korra tries to maintain neutrality in one situation that I thought was really interesting, where the two, the soldiers of two sides are about to square off because of the North attacking some kids. But when Korra tries to ma maintain neutrality, it doesn't really go well for her because the the soldiers are like, well, you're on their side. And and these kids literally throw, right after she says, I, like, right after Unlock tells her, you're going to be the best avatar ever, these kids are throwing snowballs at poor Korra, and it's like, you're the worst avatar ever. So that was a very, really, really good scene. Really shows that really the, the avatar's work is cut out for her. And I really like Unalak as a villain. I mean, he can be... He's shown as being kind and supportive, but it also masks his wickedness all the more, and it makes it all the more stinging. When you look at this guy, and he can be such a colossal asswipe, but he's also kind and supportive, which I thought was really interesting. And I can see why Korra is torn between her loyalty to her family, and learning from her uncle, who see, who really does know his shit. It's just his intentions are not in the his intentions are in the right place. And another thing, of course, there's more tension between Cora and her dad. Which, you know, I thought she would have gotten over the over this by now. Excuse me, but I guess not. So, also. Uh, there's a, the side story to this episode is Tenzin, Kia, and Bumi are all going to look for Iki, who has mysteriously vanished, and while they're searching to find her, they have a really fascinating and realistic tension between one another. It's the classic childhood squabbles that have actually amplified with age and have carried over into adulthood, and... I love that 
it show it's it suggested that Aang. Well, it's not suggested. It suggested. It's flat out said that they did not have happy childhoods. At least Kia and Boomy did not, because Aang favored Tenzin because probably because of his airbending and wasn't that good of a father to Kia and Boomy. And I just think there's something really neat and cool about how you follow this one character throughout his entire growing point as the Avatar in, in Last Airbender as Aang, but then when you get over to here in Korra, you hear that what where he succeeded as a kid, his duties as a kid, he kind of failed them as an adult uh, in f terms of family, and I thought that was really cool of this show to do. I mean, wow. Also, um, I like that there's the whole thing with Tenzin where he, it seems that he's becoming a mirror image of, image of Aang where all he focuses on is work and yet he doesn't have time for his family. <sighs> Excuse me. <laughs> um, and that, uh, maybe Tenzin's going to realize that Per saving the world is not all there is out there. I don't know, but we'll see. And there's, uh, of course, there's the comic relief with Bolin trying to break up with Desna. <laughs> that that shit is not working at all. And I love the moment when Korra and Mako are like, "Hey, let's go on a date, just the two of us." And then their party is totally crashed by Bull and Desna and Eska. That was so funny. Just the looks on all their faces. That made me laugh out loud to the point where I actually scared my dog. And poor dog. But it was such a funny moment. And it's a great counterweight to all the seriousness going on with the Civil War. That You just have a really funny yet awkward scene like that. And it's just another example of the brilliant writing in Korra, where they are able to balance the seriousness and the humor with very, very, very high skill level. And I lo the climax of this episode was, of course, the kidnapping scene, where I thought it was really heartbreaking to for Korra to realize that maybe her father really would go to such an extreme to kidnap his own brother so that they won't start a civil war. And when well, of course and of course the fight so beautifully animated. Oh my god, was was it excellent. It's a great fight and it shows that Kor really is not trying to attack her people, that she's trying to find ways around it. And that will definitely be interesting. And uh, you know well, it is interesting how she's just trying so desperately to maintain neutrality, but she can. This whole conflict is forcing her to practically take a side. And I love how she's like, no, don't send them to prison. Let them stand trial. And then, of course, after the one, the one moment, the moment when Cora finally breaks down to her parents and admits that she's sorry and how they have this really cool bonding moment really touching too how her father tells her she's so he's so proud of her and he never should have held her back but then fucking ugh, Unalak has to come in and say you you uh, you your parents are under arrest they need to stand trial and that's when it cuts and ugh, just, ugh, <laughs> I hate I hate I have to wait another week for this this is ugh. But, you know, at least it gives me something to look forward to. And, of course, I got Breaking Bad tomorrow to tie me over. So, I got that, thankfully. And also, yeah. So, I love, I also love how she's like, let them stand trial. But then the consequences of her actions really, like, affect her parents as well. I mean, just, it's a total Mass Effect moment where something you say early on, will come back to bite you in the ass much later on, or even, you know, earlier. And then it's the case here with this episode. And I'm really into, will, you know, will parent, Cora's parents, you know, 
be found innocent? Will Korra finally f maintain that neutrality she's searching for? Will Tenzin, Kia, and Bumi stop bickering and bitching at each other? And will Iki be found? I don't know. I mean, I hope so. I hope it's yes to all those questions. So, thank you for listening. I'll see you guys next week for another episode of Legend of Kara. Great fucking season so far. Really great stuff. I hope this, I hope it gets better. Anyway, thank you for watching. If you like what you see, subscribe. Have a good one.